Sanguinius stepped out into the storm. Behind him came the Luna Wolves. Before him, standing in ranks, stood the Revenant Legion. They waited in formation, statues at attention in the storm. Helmetless, they were graven in his image, several thousand faces sculpted through technomagical genetics to resemble that of the father they'd never met. Their various skin shades hid nothing, and various colors and styles of hair did not conceal the fact either. Each of them bore his visage. Sanguinius had been cognizant of this possibility without even expecting it. Many of Horus's own Luna Wolves grew to take on his features as they ascended to the Astarte state, but it was by no means ubiquitous among the legions. Here, Sanguinius looked on not to mere similarity, but simulacrum. Horus's sons resembled their Primarch as a son might take after a father. Sanguinius' sons resembled their gene sire as if his own face looked back at him in a cracked mirror. War had scarred them, but they were him to the life. And they were afraid of him. He could read it in their eyes that matched his own, and he could sense it in the tautness of the features he knew so perfectly well. The torment of expectation had goaded him to believe that his sons might rejoice at their first sight of him but the reality was altogether more tense. They feared what he represented, and the many changes that were to come. Free of the gunship confines, he stretched his wings in the rain. Nothing more than instinct, the way someone might raise a hand against a breeze or roll their shoulders to prepare for a task. But when he did it, as his white-feathered pinions flexed, several warriors in the front rank flinched. They didn't just fear what he represented, Sanguinius realized. They feared him. Maybe they feared mutation that he bore on his back, but the Primarch didn't think it was anything that simple. They feared his very presence. But why? The rain slashed unceasing, content to fill the terrible silence with the hiss of its impact. Sanguinius felt the gaze of the Luna Wolves behind him as surely as he saw the stairs of the Immortal Nine facing him. Keeping his wings close to his body, for convenience rather than caution, he started walking along the rows of gathered warriors in their storm-washed grey. He met their eyes as he passed, and marked the scars of war on their ceramite plate and transfigured flesh. In turn, they gazed up at him with the desperate hope he had been expecting coupled with a defiance he had not. They wanted this, they ached for this moment, but everything rode upon it. The pressure was practically a physical thing, bearing down upon all of them. In their faces, he read the records of the Great Crusade, the drinking of blood and the eating of flesh, for tactical advantage, for survival, and rarely, but not rarely enough, for pleasure. He read the stories told by the scars that marred their beauty, the chronicles of subterranean campaigns against mutated hordes and scarcely human populations harvested for desperately needed reinforcements. In their narrowed, awed eyes, he saw the discretionary refusal of the Divisio Militaris to supply them for munition and armor battalions to match the other newborn legions, for fear of the Revenant's degeneracy. He saw the Imperial Decrees breaking them apart to serve in splinter fleets, fragments of fragments attached to other Legion forces. The main reason it had taken so long to gather the Legion here in its entirety. He saw the hardships of their crusades and the compromises made when fate had forced their hand. In the tilt of their heads and the set of their lips, he saw the sanctions levied against them by other, nobler Legions. He saw the sins they'd committed against their own empire, and the scorn they'd endured because of it. He saw how they wore that disregard as a badge of unwelcome honor. In short, he saw them for what they were, cannibals and killers with the faces of angels. Last of all, gleaming in their brazen stares, was the knowledge of their own extinction. Their time was coming to an end. Even without Sanguinius here before their gathered ranks, the lifespan of the Immortal Ninth was decidedly mortal after all. The other legions, no matter their degree of savagery, were reliable weapons in the Emperor's arsenal. To carve a planet apart with fear, he sent the Eighth, 
to drown a rebellion in the blood of their own dead, he sent the twelve. The ruthlessness of these wild legions was still contained in the framework of the grand design. But the ninth, these bloodstained knights with their crimson rituals, these eaters of the dead, already they'd been broken up, unreliable in legion force. Host waves of the expeditionary fleets refused to fight alongside them. Again and again they were ground down to near annihilation, repeatedly bringing themselves back from the brink with tides of desperate recruitment, sustaining themselves by elevating the genetic dregs of the race to a state of imperial perfection. Their ways populated the ranks with men exalted in flesh, but still hollow in soul. Duty could only carry a soldier so far. These transhuman men fought for the Imperium, but they cared for little and they loved nothing. There was nothing ennobling in their suffering, only pride in their capacity to endure. The pride of a cornered animal is all that they have left. As soon as the thought occurred to him, Sanguinius dismissed it. No, it's not all they have left. It's all they've ever had. It's all they were ever given. How like the people of Balfora they were, so vulnerable despite their fortitude, able to survive but never thrive. Sanguinius had been adopted by the clans of pure blood and grew to become a champion. He could have ruled over them like a god-king that they believed him to be, but he had always wanted nothing more than to protect them. He elevated the tribes from the travails of their rat soaked homeland, not through his dominance over them, but by his service to them. And now, the fear of the revenants made sense. It was so obvious once he'd witnessed it with his own eyes. A truth that no hololithic report could ever convey. What would this winged demigod demand of them? Could they ever live up to what he would ask? Would they even want to try, if they despised their new father and his vision? Sanguinius kept walking, kept studying them. He thought of the oaths of fealty he could make them swear tonight. He thought of the glory he could promise them and of the pride he could convey at the Emperor granting him command of his own legion. He was their Primarch, and he had every right to play out the moment the way his sons expected it, by binding them to him with sacred oaths of their allegiance to him. But the first words he spoke to the legion were far from the bombastic speeches later chroniclers would describe. What is your name? Sanguinius asked the closest revenant, the first of the sons he had met face to face. His tone was gently firm, but curiosity evident. The scarred warrior replied, lips wet with rain. Idamas. Sanguinius saw the conflict in the man's dark eyes as the Astartes hesitated, uncertain whether to add an honorific. Thank you, Sanguinius replied. He turned to the next warrior in line. And you, what is your name? Amit. Again that hesitation, though Ahmed added a subdued, Lord, after a moment's pause. Thank you. And you? And on and on it went. Soon he wasn't going one by one anymore, instead of beckoning them to break ranks and come forward in clusters. He looked each of them in the eye as they proclaimed their names to him, many of them shouting over the others as the adrenaline of the moment took hold and he committed their identities to preternatural memory. These were his first sons, and he would remember every one of them until the day of his death. When that was done, silence descended once more, dense with expectation. Before, the revenants had regarded him with the clash of anticipation and defiant fear. Now the challenge in their stares bordered on feverish. Why did he ask for their names? What did he intend to do with this knowledge? Sanguinius saluted them, his fist against his heart, and finally he spoke. You have told me your names, and I read the records of your deeds. I know you, and I know how my father's imperium, our imperium, looks upon you. You served with loyalty and been paid in gratitude and spite, both in equal measure. You've been given difficult tasks only to find yourself mistrusted for achieving them in the ways you believed best. I will not say you were wrong to act as you have acted, 
nor will I blame those who come to fear you. That is the past, and this is our chance to step back from the edge of extinction. My first command is to bring you together once more. We will fight together as a bloodline. As of this moment, you are a broken legion no longer. The Revenant's eyes were upon him. He felt no doubts now. He knew exactly what he wanted to say. Swear to me no oaths, he told them. Make me no promises. Do not offer me your allegiance purely because my blood runs in your veins. Sanguinius laughed suddenly, the sound musical against the percussion of the storm. In fact, do not offer me your allegiance at all, not until you believe me worthy of it. The Primarch drew his sword, plunging it into the earth before the gathered ranks. He spread his wings, letting the rain sheet from them in pearlescent droplets. And then, to the amazed horror of his sons, he went to one knee in obeisance. Even with his head down, his voice carried above the storm. Instead, let me offer you my allegiance. Take my oath, here and now. I am Sanguinius, son of the Emperor, Primarch of the Ninth Legion, and I will make you this promise. I will stand with you in glory or die alongside you in shame. I come to you tonight not to enforce my ways upon you, but to learn your ways. The Revenant Legion looked upon him with breathless amazement. The punishment and chastisements that they had expected did not manifest. The self-righteous vows they'd anticipated that they must reshape themselves in their father's new image had not been spoken. This legion is not mine, Sanguinius called out to his sons as he rose back to his feet. It is not a possession to be manipulated purely by my will. This legion is ours, and though you are my sons, fated to answer to me, I am your Primarch, and I will answer to you. Sanguinius heard the Luna Wolves shifting uncomfortably. This was definitely not how it had gone with Horus. It was not how these meetings were supposed to go. The angel drew his weapon from the wet earth, raising his voice over the thunder. Each one of you is a bloodied veteran of the Great Crusade, and I too have fought the Imperium's war, learning of our empire at my brother Horus's side. But I am as new to my title as I am to the war that we fight. In time, I will come to lead you. But for now, I will only ask that you let me fight by your side. If you refuse me, I will leave with no grudges. I will break my pact with the Emperor and return to Balfora. I will leave you to survive as you've survived thus far. But if you accept my offer, let us learn, together, what our legion will be. Let us write our story as a united bloodline." Sanguinius let the rainfall clean his blade. He sheathed it in a smooth motion and rippled his wings against the storm's chill. The Emperor charged us to take this world. He wants Tegar Pentaurus. He wants it compliant before the turn of the solar month. I have seen the plans. I have seen the Imperial Army communications pleading for the presence of the Luna Wolves here, and formal requests that my brother's pristine sons remain to bring about a compliance the Ninth Legion cannot be trusted to achieve. The Revenant stood, shifted, clutched weapons tighter. They had their pride. They had it in abundance and it would make for a fine beginning. The Emperor wants this world, and the Luna Wolves would love it to be the ones who give it to him. Sanguinius paused, a half-smile on his beauteous features, the look of a man sharing a slight jest with his closest companion. It is my belief that we don't need our esteemed cousins, though. I believe we can take this planet without their aid, and in doing so we will write the first chapter of our legion's true history. He turned to the side, an intermediary between the Luna Wolf's officers and the several thousand revenants standing in broken ranks. Ezekiel Abaddon looked faintly amused. Tarek was fully grinning. What say you, warriors of the Ninth Legion? Sanguinius called out. What say you, to our noble ambassadors from the 16th. 
thousands of voices rose, a rolling thunder of mockery, refusal, and defiance. The Revenant Legion shouted down the Luna Wolves with that unified roar, also succeeding in outshouting the storm. Abaddon stepped forward, raising a hand for quiet. It took some time to descend. Tarek moved with him, and as Abaddon inclined his head in respect to the quieting Revenants, the latter gave a teasing, courtly bow. Well then, Lord Sanguinius, Tarek said, loud enough for the ranks of Astartes to hear it. It is the considered opinion of myself and my dear First Captain Abaddon here that we can pull our Legion forces back and let the Ninth handle things. Sanguinius thanked them both with his gaze, watched them moving to reboard their gunship, and then turned to face his new Legion once more. My friends, he said to the Revenants, my sons, let us make ready. We have our first war to win.